Hello and welcome to Essex by the Sea. I'm Owen Ward, exploring the Essex coast, finding out about the amazing and interesting stories it has to offer. If you'd like to support the making of the podcast, you can make a small donation via my Ko-fi page. The link for that is in the description and on social media. And thank you in advance. For this episode, I'm surrounded by hundreds, if not thousands, of baby lobsters. Gary Hum is the person behind the Thames Estuary Lobster Hatchery, which is the only one in Essex. Thanks very much for joining me. No, well, nice to see you, Owen. First of all, what is a hatchery and, and why is it needed? Well, a hatchery is a place where we can bring the baby lobsters onto a safer stage in their life cycle. So if you can imagine um, lots of larvae when they're naturally born, swimming around in the top and all of the fish go gobble gobble and they take all of the larvae out of the water because they're hungry. We get them to a stage where the, the actual lobsters go to the bottom. They're old enough to sink to the bottom and bury themselves in, which is where they hide for mainly about two years of their lives while they forage, come out of their hidey holes for, you know, just for food and go back in. And then hopefully they make it so they're big enough not to be the ones that everything's going after. You know, they become the predator. <laughs> so. Why is there the need, though, for a hatchery? Obviously, other than the fact that they get eaten by the fish, but are stock numbers of and uh, the numbers of lobsters declining? Yeah, so significantly, um, I've started potting here again in 2016. Um, the numbers were very low, and started to chat to some of the other fishermen that had been ongoing. Found out that their numbers were low, their stocks were depleting, and in the middle of that, we had the beef from the east, which. I don't know if people remember, but it washed all the crustaceans up on the shore along St. Osef, Harwich, everywhere, and they froze to death. In that wash-up, obviously there was lots of uh, brood stock, females, that we need for the procreation, the same as humans, so that we can have ongoing stocks of lobsters, which have now tailed off. We're not out of lobsters yet, but the signs are there, so this is actually to make sure that we aren't out of lobsters and that we keep the stocks healthy and have a sustainable fishery. There are literally thousands of little baby uh, lobsters around. How are lobsters born in the first place? Uh, are they hatched? Uh, are they live born? Yeah, so usually lobsters mate when the female has shed her skin. They shed her skin like um, a snake does. So they'll go out backwards. They're sort of then jelly, if you like, which then gives the male the opportunity to have a go and... Um, you know, do the business. The female can then hold on to those, um, uh, what the male's given her, for about nine months. She can then actually, from what I know, decide when she's ready to be mum, and then she'll hold the berries on the bottom of her for another nine months. So, you know, you can never tell how long it's going to be, and it is temperature driven as well. So, you know, once they've released, they are larvae. So that's how a lobster starts its life, as fry, larvae, and they swim in the middle to top parts of the water stream, and that is where the fish are. You know, they're they're eating everything they can find, and that's why we do this, because we get them through that stage, and then they're not in the top stream anymore, and that's why we push forward and make sure that they've got the best chance. So three cylinders here behind me full of water, these are where the babies are this is the nursery essentially yeah so essentially you'd have like a, a little um uh what should we call it oh my my, my kids have been born in the bathroom <laughs> um baby unit so the mother mother comes in and we just generally bring the temperature up slowly till she releases the eggs we then harvest those eggs off and keep them in what we call upwellers which are similar to these white tanks here once they start to drop to the bottom that's when you know that they'll be okay in the aqua hives, which you've got three behind you. Um, they'll go in these little segments here um, and grow and will grow them until they fit those segments. And then hopefully they'll be fit enough and ready to go. But we look after them intensely. It's an intense program. You said actually the hive there, and actually it's not too dissimilar to a beehive, no. but instead of honey in the sort of honeycomb bit, uh, if you imagine the hive sort of turned 90 degrees and sort of stacked up from the bottom, that's what these little lobsters are in. Yeah, it's a very, very similar thing. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it keeps them safe. Lobsters are carnivores. They'll eat everything, including each other. 
that's why you keep them in the separate segments. And the noise that you can hear in the background is all the uh, the pumps and fil filtration. Is it these uh, the water in these uh, tubs are crystal clear? But you said this is the water out of uh, the estuary. Yeah, this is the water out of the estuary, and obviously this not only is the nursery, it's also the filtration room. So all of the water on site comes through here. It's purified. Um, we've got protein skimmers and everything like that that makes what you see behind you crystal clear. You go down to the waterfront, all you see is murky brown, green, nothing. But in here, we clean it, let it settle, and it's perfectly good. It's, it's lovely water, there's nothing wrong with it, and it means we haven't got to make our own, which is the better thing for the, the lobsters themselves. It's not just baby lobsters you've got in here, there's three characters uh, in the tank at the end, isn't there? Yeah, so we, we have got juveniles. We do um, have different tanks with different stage juveniles in, mainly so that we can see their habi habits, their, their activity. It gives us more of an insight into what they do on the bottom as they grow, and we can sort of learn more about how we can help them and nurture them, even in the wild, you know, if we think, well, they're not growing very well in this area, but they need more algae, we can always release them in an area predominantly with more of what they need. So it's a bit of trial and error, but we have the facility now to make sure that we can watch what they do. And you're learning really then from the lobsters and, and trying to then replicate the best environment for them going forward before they release back out into the, into the sea. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's no, there isn't much information on lobsters, although we have different places around the coast, there's not a lot of information on what actually juvenile lobsters do once they're released, because you don't get to see them until they're about two years old because they hide so we have to see if we can make some sort of um, way forward so we can actually monitor what we need to do to help them otherwise you know we could fail but we don't want to do that. How important are our lobsters to the ecology then in, in, in the sea because if numbers do dwindle further I'm guessing there's then less food for the fish that you talked about that eat the babies so it's one big cycle, isn't it? But, but would that put the, then the fish stock under threat? Um, well, the less, less different species you have, if you lose one species, it has a knock-on to another species. And everything has a cycle. You know, so it's, it's a bit like digging a hole in your garden. It will fill up with water, you know, and if you dig another hole in your garden, it will fill up with water as well. You're changing things. So every time, even if it's a tiny change, that could have a massive impact later on in life. And we really do need to make sure that we don't have too many changes in our seas because fish stocks are already migrating, crab stocks. There's lots of things that are changing, but it could have all stemmed from one change in the first place. So we need to know what that change is and monitor it. Once the little baby lobsters leave the hive, how long are they in there for, do you, do you think? Roughly? They're going to be in there for about um, two to three weeks. The ones in the aqua hives we will actually take out to sea and start the release program. The tanks next door then are very much for education purposes, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, we can do conservation, but unless the children and adults can see what we're trying to conserve, then, you know, it's, it's a no-brainer. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know. So we try to show all different types of fish that are in the Essex and Thames estuary and in the Colne so that they know what they're trying to look after. I think start them young, get them moving forward so they know that that's what's under the water. It's not just brown, there's lots of life and we need to conserve that. So in the room next door, it's a little bit quieter in here, Gary, and this is uh, where you're saying the education side of things uh, happens as part of the hatchery and you can bring children in here to learn what is under our sea just off the coast. Yeah, so um, we can catch pretty much everything that's on the coastline here. Um, if we can't catch it, we know somebody that can and we bring them in um, just to show the children what is in our seas so as you can see in here we've got um, a range of uh, animals and creatures from full-size lobsters so the children can see the discrepancies and the difference between a juvenile a baby and to a fully grown lobster we've got hermit crabs which have their own sort of personalities we've got live crab brown crab um, dover sole place skate, you know, everything that's in our local estuary we have in here. Obviously it's seasonal, you know, the fish aren't here all the time, it depends on temperatures, so our tanks change. You know, we can keep some things going, but our tanks will change as the season goes round, 
um, just like the estuary would itself. So, you know, if there's no fish, well, we'll slowly have no fish. But, you know, we try and keep something in for people to see. It's, it's, it's about teaching them what's on the bottom. And in the tanks that we're standing next to here, I can see the, uh, the, the, the claws of a lobster, I guess they are. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, Just poking out from underneath yeah, that. Yeah, so the one we stood in front of the bit of tile. Of it. Yeah, he's, he's our superstar, really. He's Larry the Lobster, which the children absolutely love. I mean, he's been with me. We had, obviously, we had to test the system, make sure we could keep animals alive. So he's one of the lobsters that I caught in my pots. And he's quite happy now, you know, and the kids love it. We, he comes out, um, the kids get to touch the texture of it, feel the shell, have a look underneath, and see all the colours, because he's actually got lots of blue in him, and he's quite a colourful animal. See, I, if you'd have asked me to describe a lobster, I'd have probably said brown. I wouldn't have said blue. Yeah, well, he's got a, quite a lot of blue in his tail, which I can show you. He won't be very happy because I'm going to disturb his Sunday afternoon. But, <laughs> but as you can see, oh, yes. he's got a lot oh, of blue in him. But lobsters, yeah, lobsters do come in different sort of arrays of colours of blues and browns. And he's bluer because he's only just recently shed. So he's done what a snake does, come out of his skin. And he's got all the vibrant colours. As that's, that grows and he gets bigger, he'll go slightly deeper browns. Um, until he sheds again and then his vibrant colours will come back he'd actually got one leg missing when he came ashore which he's now got back because wow. they do regrow their limbs and if humans could learn how to do that we would have a lot less problems so that's another scientific research program but you know he's he's quite friendly and that's why he's banded his claws are banded because obviously we can't get him out with the children he gets a bit feisty you know but he's He's doing really well. He's quite a character in himself. And some days he's sort of uh, more active than others, but it all depends on temperature. In the next two tanks, we've got Harry and Big Barry. And it's just a case of showing, you know, when they're not banded, they live happily. And they move around the tank and the children can see them. And it's it literally, they can just stand and watch them for hours. I mean, they are lovely creatures to watch and they do they they have characters so, you know, these aren't pets but akin no. to what a pet might have they're not pets although you know they do all have their own characters i mean some of them are just lobsters but you get the occasional one like larry who you know he likes to perform he likes to come out and see the children and he's just naturally come like that there's you know he's not trained 24 7 he naturally does that which, you know, shows that they've got their own characters. Not just lobsters in here, in the tanks just to our uh, left, I can see uh, some crabs that would be very familiar if you were to go crabbing, and, and one particularly large one in that tank. Yeah, so we've got a, a few selections of different crabs so that the children and adults can see. We've got velvet crabs, swimmer crabs, large edible crabs, and this is also that the children can be taught how to identify different crabs, because again, conservation, you don't know what's on the shoreline, you've got to keep an eye on the number of stocks. It's not just a crab, it's whatever species of crab, because every species has something to give to the ecology of the sea. So, you know, we need to keep on top of all that. You recently had a, a funding boost from the Harwich Haven Authority. What has that then enabled you to do? Well, Harwich Haven Port Authority have been very, very good, and they're going to work with us closely, hopefully, for the next few years. They uh, helped us to put a classroom area in and that has given us a whole place now where we can um, show children um, all the different types of things that they can learn from looking at shells through microscopes, measuring, having a look at what uh, a female crab is, a male crab, uh, learning about the different textures that's in the sea, like seaweed and sand. And, Literally, you know, we can do this all year round now, thanks to Harwich Haven Ports, because we've got a dry area, obviously, because otherwise outside it'd be quite miserable in the winter, and I don't think people would be up for it, although they still do come. And it's about that education, isn't it? Because educating the next generation as to what is under our, uh, the waves out as we look out from, from our coastline. And as we were saying when we first met, actually, when you look out, you, you don't see all the variety of animals that are here in the tanks because you just can't see them in camouflage or they're under rocks or way out to sea. So to be able to see this up close, that must really help the children. 
Yeah, so some of them are absolutely amazed. I mean, they're, they're, wow, what's that? Wow, what's this? You know, and when they come here, we give them a tick sheet because obviously some of the creatures in the tanks are small, some hide. So they come in, we give them a tick sheet and they see if they can find them. And really, once they've found them, they have to really look sometimes, but they then move forward and go, yes, we know what that is. So if they ever come across it, they'll know what they're looking at, whereas at the moment, they know that the sea's there, and, but they know what certain fish are, but they don't know what they look like. So they get a sense of what actually there is. Um, I, I don't think you can beat that. I've noticed where I've been talking in this tank next to me that, that there is a fish that has been swimming around. What's that one? So you've got a Dover sole there who's just moved, moving now. Um, so they're uh, a mainstay fishery of the Thames estuary. Um, again, you know, I think the stocks are having a few little fluctuations and that could be something that as a conservation centre we may be involved in as we move forward. You know, we're not predominantly, I don't think, just going to be lobsters. I think because we're trying to do conservation, I think we will eventually look into all types of conservation to make sure that there's a baseline for all types of fish and we can then see what we can do, bring the universities in, bring the scientific research in and give them a base to watch animals, see if they can see what's going on. And I think, you know, we're, we're better to do it than in Brightling Sea. Clearly, conservation is, is a, a passion of yours. Have you always been involved in conservation yourself? How did you get involved in this? Well, I'm the child that would pick the bird up. So I'd pick the bird up and take it home, put it in a box and hope that it survived. We know the story never ends too well sometimes maybe but you know that disappointment but I've always done it you know um, I was working on the wind farm once and there was a a cat had left its litter and I was taking 12 kittens with me and feeding them via bottle sadly they got an infection but I tried what else could I do and yeah I suppose yeah I suppose animals have always been my thing but to be honest I mean you know I watched the fishing fleet sort of die in front of my eyes as I grew up in Brightling Sea and you know the only way to see that grow again is to conserve what we've got so if out of all of this we get three more fishermen working locally in the next five years great you know that's where we are you know it's all about it's not just about what we're trying to do it's trying to do it for the future and I think that that is where everybody needs to go now we're not looking in the past anymore we know what happened in the past, we just need to make sure the future's got what everybody needs. Finally, Gary, in the TV show Friends, there's a line in there that says that it's a well-known fact that lobsters mate for life. Is that true? I don't know. I mean, lobsters go walk about in the summer months, and I'm, I'm fairly sure that that is um, for mating purposes, but I don't know if there is any study-based evidence that says they mate for life it'd be a very difficult thing to prove it'd be a nice thought wouldn't it maybe but you will maybe you'll be the first to discover maybe I will it. yeah <laughs> I mean you know you never know we, we haven't I think we've only got we haven't got a female in at the moment um, but really you know once the females come in it's their job to procreate so we'd like them to go back to sea but you know who knows you know we've got some of the smaller ones we'll grow them on and see what they do you know I'd, I'd love it if that was, we'd have the marriage from heaven, it'd be like Kylie and Jason. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for, no, for showing me around and, and uh, telling us about it. All the best for uh, the future plans you've got for the hatchery. Yeah, and I say we look forward to seeing people and yourself come back and have a look around and see what, how you can help with conservation. You know, come and support us. Um, we will be posting something out online on our Thames Estuary Facebook page where you can book and we look forward to seeing you. And if you want to see pictures, then do go to the uh, social media pages. Uh, I'll post a a couple of pictures up as well on the Essex by the Sea social media, uh, which is on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. So if you haven't already, do go and like that. Gary, thank you ever so much. And thank you for listening.